My name is Haley. I work with the Columbia Mountains Institute. Um, we're a nonprofit organization. We're based here in Revelstoke. We primarily put on professional development opportunities for people working in the various fields of ecology, and so that includes mostly conferences and courses, that sort of thing. Right now, um, I'm working on a number of courses, which include an amphibian ID course. We're doing a number of statistics courses we always do. We have a bioacoustics course coming up. Uh, one of the fun things about the courses that we're doing in Revelstoke in the next few months is that we've been able to engage the high school students. So a lot of our instructors are, of course, teaching at these fairly high levels, but uh, they're coming into the high school and they're putting on um, some smaller mathematics lessons or getting the kids a whole bunch of bioacoustic equipment and letting them go out and record and ID things and that sort of stuff. So that's been pretty fun and different for me lately. Um, I'm also working on a conference which is about camera trapping, um, sort of scaling up camera trapping and analyzing that data on, on a large scale. The call for presentations is still out, so if you know anybody who you think might have interest in that, let me know. I have a printed copy of the call for presentations just over there, and of course, come and ask me any questions you might have. Um, the other thing we do, of course, is we put on these cred talks. So this is our fourth season. This season is sponsored by the Columbia Basin Trust, so thank you to them. Hi, everyone. And um, we've got... Just two talks. Well, we've got Danielle's talk today, and then we have one more talk after that. Danielle works with Parks Canada, um, and she's going to be delivering a talk on wildlife mitigations and highway improvements along the Trans-Canada Highway and Mount Revelstoke and Glacier National Parks. A uh, little bio here. Danielle works for the Parks Canada Agency and has since 2010. Uh, her primary role has been in leading the environmental assessment program for Mount Revelstoke and Glacier National Parks. However, she spent several years um, in that tenure working on wildlife as a wildlife vegetation ecologist for both parks. More recently, she's been keen to adapt different management and mitigation strategies along the transportation corridors to facilitate wildlife movement. Um, that would include fish, goats, bears, and amphibians. Recently, uh, she's been doing work that has included culvert replacements, channel restorations for fish passage, amphibian fencing and crossing tunnels, and wildlife ramps to facilitate movement over avalanche sheds that protect the highway. I imagine you'll probably touch on that in your presentation. So Danielle's received her master's degree in environmental management with a focus on forest ecology and climate change from rural roads, um, university, and a bachelor's degree in environmental, bio yeah, environmental biology from the University of Lethbridge. So thank you very much for making the time for us today. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Haley, <clears throat> uh, for the introduction and the opportunity to be here. I'll uh, compete with the toddlers in the hallway. So if you missed something or couldn't hear me, just ask me to repeat it. And uh, I think we'll save all the questions for the end. So if you can hold your questions, that would probably uh, help the recording and the process a little bit. So as Haley introduced, I'll talk today about some of the highway infrastructure upgrades that we've had in Glacier National Park uh, over the last five years. I'm sure any of you that drove east got to experience a lot of the work that we've been uh, undergoing. And uh, I think we're happy and sad to say the program's over, happy because we've accomplished uh, quite a lot of work on the corridor. but. Um, of course, with any um, infrastructure program, the list is much longer than any of the funding. So there's always more work that we could be doing. One of the things I'll highlight a little bit uh, in this talk is a bit about the Impact Assessment Act, which was recently revamped uh, in August 2019 under a large omnibus bill that some of you may be aware of. There's a few changes in that, but our environmental review process is a little bit different than in the in the um, in Parks Canada Agency than it is in the province, so I'll touch on that very lightly before I sort of jump into the wildlife mitigations that we've successfully installed over the last several years. So a little bit about the Federal Infrastructure Program. 2015, it was announced over 95 million was invested in highway safety and avalanche improvements just in Glacier National Park. A lot of the work you drove through, and there's countless amounts of projects that you can't see from the highway corridor that were part of this 95 million. The Impact Assessment Act uh, that, as I mentioned, was revised from a 2012 revision and revised in 2019. 
uh, integrates our mandate for environmental and cultural protection. And Parks Canada has employed sort of a tiered system in order to assess projects. And the purpose for that is to ensure that our uh, environmental review and our impact assessment, um, the scope of it matches the projects. So large, complicated projects require larger, more complicated analysis. Uh, basic routine projects, uh, we're able to apply sort of more stand uh, industry standard uh, mitigations and way to sort of handle the adverse environmental effects that could be part of the project. Just briefly, some of the changes to that new act. The big changes for the new act was to enhance transparency, so it brought back an element of public consultation that was removed in 2012. Uh, it provides some more, uh, a clearer direction on Indigenous engagement, incorporation of knowledge, as well as incorporation of community knowledge. And there's a much uh, larger emphasis on understanding cumulative effects of not only the project proposed, but other projects and changes across the landscape at a larger level. So under the Act, there's a number of ways a project can be assessed. This top one is the physical activities regulations. People refer to that often as the designated projects. And these are really, really big projects, pipelines, new transportation corridors, and these projects would actually be assessed by the Impact Assessment Office at a different level than Parks Canada. It's very rare that Parks Canada, um, you know, given our history, given the establishment of town sites, uh, sort of the projects that we have within our own boundaries, that we would actually trigger any of these designated projects at a federal level. Uh, the next section requires that all projects in federal lands undergo an impact assessment. And so, we have several um, pathways that I mentioned where we scale the assessment to uh, meet the project. And this helps us meet not only our mandate for cultural visitor, visitor impacts, but we have several other federal legislation that we have to uphold. So the Fisheries Act, Navigable Waters, Species at Risk Act, etc. And then under Section 88 in this new act, <coughs> projects that are federal land, so for instance, Parks Canada lands, um, if they have an existing uh, assessment, then no impact assessment is required because they've already been previously assessed. So this project, um, small repetitive projects that fall into what they call a pre-approved pre routine impact assessment, we can apply that. So projects that that would involve, for example, would be if we needed to um, build a new section of hiking trail where there was a small washout, there was no streams being impacted, there's no species at risk, it was a fairly minor project, then we'd be able to implement that part of the act. So this is sort of how we, um, this is sort of the uh, legislation that we follow when we're looking at our larger, any of our, any of our physical activities and parks limits. So by the end of the 2019 construction season, there is a number of mitigation measures that were completed as part of these impact assessments that started as early as 2012-2013. Um, a lot of the initiatives that I'll present today are relatively new. Uh, they haven't been trialed in a lot of other places or a lot of other highways. Um, they are certainly based on some emerging science and we feel that they're representing some environmental gains, perhaps some big environmental gains, and a lot of that will be sort of to be seen as we test uh, the application of these. So wildlife underpass. So for those of you that are familiar with Rogers Pass, um, you've driven past the Rogers Pass Discovery Center. Uh, the road there has been widened. There's some additional areas to park cars when we have avalanche closures. And close to there, there's a large uh, creek that comes down um, from the Blue Valley and crosses the highway, and that's called Knott Creek. So the Highway Engineering Services, who we work closely with for uh, Trans-Canada Highway Improvements throughout the mountain parks, they proposed to build a box culvert, which you can kind of see oops, over here on the right picture. So it used to be this culvert right here. And so not only did it provide a barrier to fish, because it was built in such a way that it had a huge... Uh, drop on the outlet ends, fish couldn't get up, the water went through there really quickly. 
the box culvert not only allowed fish to move upstream, but we left this large oblong culvert in the ground in hopes that maybe it would facilitate some wildlife passage under the highway. Um, I had mentioned earlier that some of these ideas are relatively new and not tried because, you know, when you think of wildlife crossings, you think of the overpasses in Banff. They're big, they're robust, they're open. Um, these sort of culverts sometimes people are skeptical whether or not they'll actually like permit large animals like bears to pass through it. This particular culvert is about three meters wide, but it's an oval, and it's a total of 52 meters in length, so it's pretty long, kind of dark. But the things it had going for is it had a lot of vegetation uh, approaching it, so over here there's lots of vegetation. Um, it's a bit removed from it's a bit removed from where there's a, a bit more parking and a roadway. Uh, we installed some baffles in the culvert, so just little uh, aluminum ridges and filled it with some cobbles and gravel so it would feel better on the feet of animals. And we set up some cameras to see if anybody, any animals, decided to use the culvert to cross underneath the highway. We captured the images of this bear last spring, but unfortunately um, we didn't capture him leaving the culvert. So we don't know if this bear just came and checked the culvert out or if we actually went through. And part of the challenge is because, as you know, in Rogers Pass, you get a significant snow load. And so how we pay, place our cameras uh, throughout the year and how we change them will sort of determine the images that we get. So when, at this particular time, the camera on the other end of the culvert was positioned so that just with the snowpack, it didn't capture the outlet of the culvert. We have had confirmation of several small mammals going through, so some pine marten, I think one hare, um, speaking with some of the other wildlife ecologists that uh, have made a career on wildlife crossing structures, they'll, they say that uh, for bear species, it may be a year or two before they actually use an underpass like this. They'll come check it out from year to year, uh, and once they feel comfortable with it, they'll actually pass through it. And this image was taken before the cobble substrate had been placed inside the culvert. So now this material actually blends its way all the way through. So it might be a little bit more attractive for bear to travel through. Whether it would be used predominantly by grizzly bears or black bears, it's hard to say, but we'll continue to monitor it and see what kind of effectiveness it has. A couple of the advantages of just leaving it in there is there's a lot less disturbance to the site by leaving it there and open. Um, although people tend to discount small mammals, they have a pretty big role to play in our ecosystem. So even if it only facilitates the crossage of pine martens or hares or um, you know, maybe even a coyote, then it's still successful, even if bears decide not to use it. Um, this is this was an interesting project. Um, so field fitting a natural creek along the Trans Canada Highway. I know there's a couple of engineers in the room, and uh, my experience, engineers they like straight lines, and uh, things are at relatively orderly, like this drawing over here. And it's nice straight. There's nice little step pools, but nature isn't as orderly as uh, many designs that we see. Nature's a little messy. It likes things to move and, and change. And so this particular site was um, in Rogers Pass, and it's on a section of highway where they were doing some widening. So they needed to take this fill slope, and they needed to make it quite a bit bigger. And so on this original design, this is all new fill slope, and they're going to move the new channel just right along here at the total slope, through some a great conversation with the designers and the, and the contractors, we were able to, to come up with a plan that could push the new creek channel over to this tree line and sort of allow it to meander naturally with the topography and with some uh, stumps and vegetation that was there. And then in addition, we were able to leave a strip of vegetation between the what will be the new construction and the new channel, and that would provide a little bit of a vegetation buffer while they're doing the work, so we didn't have to worry as much about sediment coming into the creek and that sort of thing. And then we could create a channel that looked like more like the old channel, and it would be a little bit further away from the highway, so less road and gravel from winter operations sort of going into the creek. These are just some images of the construction. So. Rather than sort of creating a, 
uh, sort of straight step pool, which would meet all your flood requirements and that sort of thing, which didn't really meet a lot of your ecological needs. We were able to take some of the local timber uh, that we cut from the edge of the, the tree line, place that in the creek, plop some root balls in there, make some great little habitat for fish, so places for them to rest and cover um, by adding uh, different types of rocks and wood debris into the creek, you kind of help that community of bugs reestablish so that the fish have food to eat. And all this we were able to do while the old channel was still running over here. So we didn't have to do any diversions, we didn't have to pump water around, we didn't have to disturb the fish that were already in that channel while we built the new one. These are just some more images of how we did it. So again, here's the old fill slope. Uh, here's where they started to grub in the new channel. This is the old creek right here. And in order to facilitate the work, um, the contractor lifted a bridge in over the creek so he could cut in the new channel. And this is all done. <clears throat> Once the new channel is created, then we can move the water over to it. So we could do it all in the dry, which is is from an environmental perspective in construction, it's much much easier in a lot of respects. And as far as the fish species, it's better for them too. And this is it a year. This is it the following. This is it. This picture here is in the fall when the creek channel was done, and we flipped the water back in. And this was in the spring, so we seed it and plant it quite late in the year. And this is as things started to regrow. And so one of the other advantages of not stripping out all the native material and sort of leaving that vegetation buffer and we left a lot of the natural soil here. We just sort of uh, um, they excavated it out from the new channel and placed it on the other banks. We had regrowth happening so much quicker because we had the native seedbed. This was another neat project that we successfully completed in the past as part of the Federal Infrastructure Program. Um, uh, during some work that happened in the east part of Glacier National Park in the Beaver Valley, there were some minor impacts to the wetland complexes that are along that uh, stretch of highway. So if you leave the snow sheds, drop down the valley, and before you leave the east boundary of the park on your way to Golden, that's the Beaver Valley, and there's lots of wetlands through there big major river. Um, we had uh, through lots and lots of discussions with the engineers um, in the design phases we were able to reduce the impact of some of these really functional really healthy wetlands um, down to only 200 meters squared that was impacted. Uh, under the federal, the federal wetland policies uh, we proposed a compensation value of about three to one. So we disturbed 200 meters of wetland. Uh, we just determined that we're going to restore 600 meters of wetland. Went out into the field several days. It's kind of hard to find a spot to just create a wetland. Um, wetland compensation works really well when you have an impacted site where you know you can maybe take, maybe clean it up or maybe avoid some of the impacts, but to just go in and build a new wetland can be quite challenging. So after lots of discussions, we thought we would target an area where we, we have a service road that goes to a trail system in the Beaver Valley uh, when western toads, which are a Schedule 1 species at risk, um, when they're leaving the toadlets, the baby toads are leaving their breeding sites, they cross the road and they often get run over. So this project was an opportunity to put up some amphibian fencing and some amphibian tunnels to allow um, the toads to cross the road. Uh, this project was completed after the toadlet migration last year, so we haven't been able to monitor its effectiveness, but there's really no indication why it would, wouldn't be effective to move toadlets across the road. We're pretty excited to get some, uh, some images. We have cameras, uh, set up here as well, and, um, Photos. This is what it looks like along the Beaver Valley Road. Is there people uh, familiar with that trail system? Yeah, so if you're there in the summer, if you go back there next summer and you see these fences, that's what uh, that's what they're related to. You can stop and you can see the little uh, pop-outs where, um, where the, the actual tunnels are.
We have a total of uh, four crossing structures under there uh, along the road. Another um, outcome of some of the environmental mitigations from the impact assessments was related to um, some work we did in the snow sheds. These were some off ramps um, that were proposed. We had a, um, a research report done in 2014 <coughs> that looked at uh, our priority wildlife crossings. So we had a couple of scientists looking at all of our data, looking at where we would have uh, the most likely places where we'd have animals crossing the highway, particularly bears and goats, because that's where we have our highest mortality recorded. And so we propose these off-ramps off the snow sheds. They're quite a simple design when you consider some of the larger um, wildlife crossing structures in, in other places around the world. Uh, we built a total of four ramps, and they're three different styles. I'll, uh, I have some photos here to show you. One of them is an earthen ramp, so it's built with locked blocks, and these are just concrete the concrete blocks are stacked together. And uh, two photos. So the one on the right is the earthen block, and it comes off the snow shed. And then these are just steps, which we hope will help facilitate goats. Um, again, coming back to the untested and relatively novel ideas. These haven't been tried in other places, although um, having presented at a conference in California earlier or late last year, there's quite a bit of interest in how effective these will be. Um, some similar work that's been done will show that goats will easily use them once they get used to them and know they're there. Um, based on some of our pre ba our baseline data, we are really hoping that we'll be able to get some grizzly bears uh, will be using this. Um, what the problem here is is that when the goats are on the on the far side of the sheds and they want to come down off the mountains, they end up coming out onto the highway and they get into the sheds, and that's where they're obviously they're hit and often killed. And so if we can keep them on top of the sheds and they can travel over the top of the sheds, then hopefully we're gonna our goal is to reduce the mortality. So um, in the scope of wildlife mitigations, these are relatively low cost. Um, and hopefully they'll be quite successful. And other, uh, we can uh, model these in the provincial sheds and other snow sheds uh, across the province and other places and build some similar ones. And just for a bit of scale, this ramp here is about three meters wide, and these are only about a meter and a half. And they're relatively steep. Um, I think they're around 70 or 80 percent slope. My mouth is right. That's it. Does anybody have any questions? Are you going to trade the animals to use the ramps? That's a great question. So I just asked how we'll get the animals to habituate the ramps. Um, some of the things we're thinking, specifically for goats. This doesn't apply so much for bears, but the goats, for the snowshed area where we have goats that are using very well-defined trails, um, we have been discussing with other wildlife ecologists to decommission those trails and bring them to the highway and try to um, sort of create some sight lines or some paths to keep them on top of the sheds and then over to the, over to the ramps. I think it's going to take a, f a few years, but... Based on what I understand from goat behavior is that they can be relatively, that they're not as adverse to change as some other species. So that's kind of how we're hoping to do it. Um, we also have plans for some wing fencing at the entrance of the sheds. So we can establish those to sort of create a bit of a barrier to keep the goats from going onto the road. And maybe they'll go back up and look for another way. Our challenge with fencing in Glacier, of course, is the snow load. So it has to be seasonal fencing. and what kind of fencing do you use and what's the sort of, you know, labor that goes into putting them up and taking them down each year. So I think, I think it'll probably be three to five years before we have some reportable results from the effectiveness of them. But the cost benefit, I think, will outweigh that time, the cost to install them if we can reduce mortalities in the snow sheds.
I have considered salt, yeah, um, as a way. So uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with, like, uh, ungulate or goat or sheep diversionary tactics, there's a number of places where they've employed um, uh, sending salt blocks off the road to keep uh, goats or sheep from coming to the roadway to lick what they presume is road salt because they're looking for sort of natural minerals in their diet. So some considerations are, like, perhaps placing some salt to kind of get them used to using the trail. And then once they start using the trail, then we take the salt away and hope they keep using the ramps. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Beaver Valley Road, it, it is open in the winter, but not for a vehicle. So you can ski tour down the road. Or snowshoe. Or snowshoe, cross-country ski. But, yeah, it's not plowed in the winter. That was part of the reason why we proposed the toad, the toad fencing structures along the Beaver Valley was because of our snow loads and snow removal. Trying to do it anywhere else is virtually impossible, but because we don't do active snow removal there, typically, um, I'm hoping that the, the lifetime of those fences will be safe from snow removal.